Um, so hi everyone and welcome to session 11 of the Punishment in Global Peripheries workshop. Um, I'm Lucy Harry um, from the Centre for Criminology and I will be the chair of this session. Um, we'll have three presentations this morning. So first we will hear from Natalia antelak Saper of Monash University, um, followed by Rachel Noah of Oxford University and finally today <laughs> Luna of Ibero Americano Puebla University. And our discussant today is Professor Carolyn Hoyle of Oxford University. Each speaker will speak for about 20 minutes and following all three presentations, we'll have the discussant's comments. Um, after this, we'll have time for a Q&A in which you can raise your hand and I will call upon you to ask your question. You're also more than welcome to write your question in the chat box, um, but they will not be addressed until after the discussant has finished her comments. Um, I should also let you know before we begin that the speaker's presentations will be recorded this morning, um, but the Q&A will not be. Um, and yeah, a reminder to mute yourself as well during the presentations. Um, I think that's all from me, so I will hand over now to Natalia for our first presentation. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so I'll just spend a few seconds getting this up and running, and hopefully that's working there. Um, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining from today. I'd like to thank Lewis and Maximo for providing me the opportunity to be here today and to share my research with you. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land I'm gathered here today in Australia, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Today I'll be discussing the death penalty in the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations region, and examining several factors that can be said to either positively or negatively contribute to the abolition of the death penalty in the region. These specific factors are penal populism, um, and within that the so-called populist leader, public opinion, and then the role of the ASEAN organization itself. According to Amnesty International, in 2019, more than two thirds of countries in the world had abolished or suspended the death penalty, either in law or in practice. An exception to this positive trend is in the ASEAN region, a region defined by the intergovernmental organization of 10 Southeast Asian countries, Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. Of the 10 member countries of ASEAN, only Cambodia and the Philippines have abolished the death penalty to date. Offenses that attract the death penalty in the region include murder, treason, economic crimes such as corruption, and drug-related offenses. Given that the region contains countries that may be a source, destination, or transit point for the global drug trade, the latter features heavily both domestically and internationally as a key justification for the death penalty in a number of these countries. In my paper today, I'm focusing specifically on drug offenses and the death penalty, although issues observed in this context may be extrapolated to a broader context. Now, there are a number of proximate causes that contribute to the abolition of the death penalty in any given jurisdiction. And here, when I say proximate causes, I mean those causes that are as closest to causing abolition, of course, accepting that a limitation of such a discussion is that it may be truly difficult to ascertain what the ultimate causes in fact are. One of such recognized causes is that of political elites. So within this context, I think it's first helpful to determine how political elites may develop and implement criminal reform. Criminal justice policies are typically not the product of a well-reasoned, highly planned and strategic process. One model that attempts to capture this complex process is proposed by Julian Roberts and colleagues. And here we can see that it's the strategic decision that leads to punitive penal policies which may be influenced by secondary factors such as public opinion, the media, triggering events, and conservative political views. These in turn are shaped by a variety of structural and cultural conditions which form the third level, including fear of crime, media representation, and misinformation in respect of crime. Against this background, it's useful to consider one of the most significant insights into the way criminal justice policy can be formed, and that is the concept of penal populism. The term connotes a move away from evidence-based government policy towards a less informed approach that is typically influenced by mood sentiments in an attempt to guarantee electoral success at the cost of proven effectiveness. In a broader sense, this concept may be used to describe the process of politicians and policymakers. Um, sorry, I think I've just moved 
Yes, there we go. Sorry. Um, in policy and policy makers exploiting community anxiety that may stem from issues such as decline in social cohesion, unemployment, and the breaking down of welfare nets. In this context, the promise of criminal justice reform is intended to focus and channel the public's concern about crime and frustrations with governments. Penal populism is commonly driven by feelings of anger, disenchantment, disillusionment with the criminal justice system, and it can also be fueled by division and dissent in the community rather than consensus. Penal populism typically employs a tabloid rhetoric style of communication that bears simplicity and directness. A key but important feature here is the notion that severe punishment is effective. And therefore, where the phenomenon of penal populism is observed, so are harsh criminal justice mechanisms for social control, partly to address the so-called public's demand for tough on crime. The phenomenon of penal populism has arguably been observed in many jurisdictions worldwide, including in key ASEAN states. In the Philippines, for example, in his campaign for a president, Duterte introduced a populist dichotomy, positioning the virtuous citizen on the one hand and the hardened criminal on the other. The election of Duterte also demonstrated a shift from political elitism to penal populism, and his campaign presented a dystopian criminal justice narrative, which subsequently facilitated a discussion of urgent populist solutions. It should be noted, of course, that in of itself, this wouldn't necessarily translate to a successful election, but rather this dialogue taps into pre-existing anxieties in the community about illegal drugs and drug offences. In Thailand in 2003, then Prime Minister Thaskin Shinawatra launched a war on drugs, which was aimed at suppressing drug trafficking and the prevention of drug use. In the first three months following his public pronouncement, there were approximately 2,800 extrajudicial killings, and thousands more were coerced into a so-called treatment programs. Here again, the political dichotomization could be observed. The Thai government presented drug users and drug dealers as a threat to community safety. And the political campaign in Thailand also tapped into pre-existing anxieties across the Thai political spectrum. Poor Thais were concerned about the social decay by drug addiction, while middle and upper class Thais feared the impact of drug-related crime on public safety and the security of property. In Indonesia, upon becoming president in 2014, Joko Widodo Jokowi declared drugs as the number one problem facing Indonesia and promised swift action. In his efforts to combat issues pertaining to drugs, Jokowi lifted the moratorium on the death penalty for drug dealers, and Indonesian authorities were also given shoot on site orders, and Jokowi even encouraged vigilantism. Similar observations can be made about Singapore, which experienced its age of anxiety in the 1970s. This was largely attributed to uncertainties and insecurities that are caused by social economic restructuring. Singapore too has experienced a narrative of drugs being constructed as serious threats from which the community must be protected. And this protection typically takes the form of tough, unpopular and repressive state interventions. A common characteristic that leaders such as Duterte, Faskin and Jokofi share is that they are populists. And populists differ from different types of political leaders in that they lack a deeply institutionalized base of support. Rather, populists look to target as broad of an audience as possible. And in this regard, populists find that using a tough on crime approach, particularly in respect of antisocial crime, such as drug dealing and drug use, is an extremely useful tool in bringing together what may be considered as otherwise quite a diverse coalition. In the context of the death penalty, public opinion and abolition, some suggest that public opinion is a non-cause. For example, Johnson suggests that public opinion does not play a role at all, arguing that in Asia as elsewhere, jurisdictions that have abolished the death penalty have done so despite the fact that there was strong majority support at the point of abolition. And this is consistent with an analysis conducted by Sun Beal of four case study countries where abolition of the death penalty was successful. In her study, Sun Beal argues that political elites in these countries accorded with their own views rather than that of the public. And this political behavior is often referred to as elite leadership hypothesis, pursuant to which political leaders are insulated from public opinion and pressure and thereby relegating public opinion as not relevant in the criminal justice policy-making process. 
A similar experience of leadership from the front has been observed in countries such as South Korea and Taiwan in explaining significant execution declines. Elite leadership hypothesis also provides an explanation for why st certain states continue to uphold the death penalty and or maintain high rates of execution. For example, as Johnson states, when China embarks on one of its strike hard campaigns, the prime mover here is Beijing and not populist sentiment in the provinces. Similarly, the main difference that explains the large and long-standing gap in execution rates between, for example, Singapore and Malaysia is not between the average person in the street in these two nations. Now, notwithstanding this, it is suggested that the discussion pertaining to the role of public opinion is more nuanced, particularly when we consider the role of the populist leader. For example, it's undoubtedly true that public opinion in many ASEAN countries is supportive of what may be described as punitive criminal justice policies, including the death penalty, particularly in the context of drug offenses. For example, despite the significant national and international criticisms of the human rights violations entailed in the extrajudicial killings of drug dealers, the programs appear to be highly popular. In Thailand, 74% of Thais supported Thaskin's violent anti-drug campaign. In 2018, approximately 80% of those living in rural Thailand believe that the sale and use of illegal drugs continues to be an issue of significant concern in the country. In Indonesia, drug dealers are perceived to be the third biggest threat which warrants the application of the death penalty, after corruption and terrorism, but ahead of murder. In the Philippines, there is rich survey data on support for the anti-war drug since the beginning of Duterte's administration in mid-2016, with widespread support across class, gender, and regional groups. The elite leadership hypothesis would suggest that such public opinion is not relevant to political elites seeking to abolish the death penalty. However, the reverse need not be true. For the political elite that is supportive of the death penalty, public opinion may be used as evidence of political support for retention, particularly in response to international pressures for abolition. That public opinion is not irrelevant to populist leaders is exemplified by the fact that in some cases, they are in fact driving that opinion. For example, according to Holmes, Duterte's endorsement of the government's anti-drug campaign had a small but significant positive effect on the support of that campaign. However, the Pulse Asia Research Survey also indicated that at the same time, Duterte was responding to popular concern. So this relationship between the populist leader and the public opinion may be seen as a feedback loop. Populists are both the cause and effect. They drive popular concerns over social issues like drug crime and addiction, but they also respond to and exploit them. Further, Michelle Miao suggests that claims that authoritarian political regimes do not consider public opinion are erroneous. Rather, authoritarian regimes can be very attentive and responsive to public opinion. Focusing on the Chinese penal regime, Miao suggests that public calls for revenge, justice, and equality translates into a fervent pa passion for capital punishment for certain offenses and offenders. In responding to these calls, the party state hopes to enhance its political legitimacy. In this context, the death penalty is used as a populist tool that furthers the agenda of the party state. In a separate study, Miao provides evidence of the fact that Chinese legal elites were not adequately informed about public opinion on the death penalty. So therefore, a populist sentiment's drive administration of capital punishment is closely tied to a reliance on capital punishment. This again demonstrates a feedback loop, nature relationship between public opinion, legal elites, and political elites. When discussing public opinion, it's of course important to consider how it is measured, there being significant methodological problems engaging the views of the public. Notwithstanding the limitations of measuring public opinion, a number of consistent themes emerge from research concerning the role of public opinion in penal policies. The first of these is that if not provided with contextualized and detailed information, the public will generally have a tendency to be more punitive. The second is that the public has in fact, little accurate knowledge about the criminal justice system. And these themes are consistent with a recent meta study of public opinion surveys on the death penalty for drug offenses in a number of Asian countries conducted by Giada Girelli. 
in a review of 39 public opinion surveys on the death penalty in five case study countries, Jarelli analyzed the design, methodology, findings, and the relationship between these elements. And the meta-study evidenced that 37 of the surveys recorded a majoritarian support for the death penalty, driven by beliefs in deterrent effect of the death penalty and perfect justice. This complex, the complex surveys found a low level support for interest in and knowledge of the death penalty. And rigorous polling exercises demonstrate that public support for the death penalty, both specifically for drug offenses and more broadly, is instinctive, abstract, elastic, and contextual. And this is supported by pre-existing literature on this issue. It can therefore be seen that the role of public opinion in the context of the death penalty and drug offenses is an important one to understand as approximate cause to furthering abolition. What we're now going to turn to is to consider the role of treaties, international agreements and norms, all of which potentially play an important role in shaping the views of the populist leader and other political elites. Here specifically, we're gonna look at the role of the ASEAN and its most relevant treaties. Now reforms concerning the death penalty must be ultimately made at a domestic level but international norms may be influential in furthering the abolitionist agenda. This is largely explicable because when states sign international treaties, they're simply making a preliminary endorsement of that treaty. In signing, a state is merely indicating that it will consider examining the treaty domestically and potentially ratifying. To make any given treaty part of domestic law, a state has to create legislation that incorporates the requisite articles into its domestic legislation. And a country that acts contrary to a ratified treaty may face international pressures to comply with these obligations. In this context, regional organizations can play a crucial role in bringing pressure to bear amongst closely aligned nations. Nowhere has this been more apparent than in Europe. And here the Council of Europe has played a leading role in furthering the abolitionist movement. Nearly all 47 states of the Council of Europe have now abolished the death penalty with the exceptions of Belarus and Russia. And abolishing the death penalty is now a prerequisite to entering the European Union, which has been an impetus for death penalty reform as states have wished to gain membership to the EU. Legislation and agreements with abolitionist countries, such as extradition treaties and mutual assistance obligations, can also play a vital role in the abolitionist movement. Here, the transnational nature of drug offending particularly requires the importance of mutual legal assistance between jurisdictions, and such assistance and extradition arrangements may be refused with countries that retain the death penalty. In addition, trade policies can encourage countries to comply with international human rights obligations. And as a regional organization akin to the Council of Europe with a stated commitment to human rights, it's argued that ASEAN is an important vehicle for the abolition of the death penalty in the Southeast Asian region. ASEAN was first established in 1967 with the signing of the ASEAN Declaration, the Bangkok Declaration, by the founding countries of Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand. The Bangkok Declaration contains the basic principles of ASEAN, including mutual respect for sovereignty, effective cooperation, and renunciation of the threat or use of force. There are a number of major political accords of ASEAN, but most notably for the purpose of this topic, it's worth noting that in 2012, the 10 member states adopted the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. And this is significant for two reasons. First, until its introduction, the Asia Pacific region was the only geographic bloc not to have a regional human rights instrument. And secondly, the regional document was also a mechanism to incorporate principles from the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Although the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration carries moral weight, it's not a legally binding document. Nonetheless, it's viewed as a step in the right direction of an increased promotion of human rights in the region and through the incorporation of the UN Declaration principles can be used as an influential norm in the region to facilitate the abolition of the death penalty. To date, ASEAN has led coordinated efforts in the region to address issues such as climate change and economic integration. It's therefore in theory capable of providing an effective forum for multilateral dialogue on the death penalty. Of course, it's important to recognize that unlike the Council of Europe and the European experience, certain features of ASEAN can limit its ability in furthering the abolition movement. First, ASEAN 
does not have a unified identity and therefore does not have normative principles. Further, ASEAN member states have a strong commitment to state sovereignty and non-interference as exemplified by the fact that they are enshrined in the ASEAN constitutional documents. This means that ASEAN is obligated to respect state sovereignty and therefore is curbed in its attempt at enforcing policy change at the domestic level. Here in particular, the populist leader may point to public opinion as a means of justifying retention of the death penalty in the face of outside pressure towards abolition. To therefore use ASEAN as a mechanism for facilitating abolition may be unachievable. But rather, in a similar way to the European experience, once member states abolish the death penalty, the regional organization may be used as a mechanism to prevent reintroduction of the death penalty. Ultimately, as evidenced by this discussion, it is the extent to which political elites accept and use the death penalty that has the strongest influence in terms of whether ASEAN states retain or abolish the death penalty. As the penal populism lens illuminates, a key factor here is public opinion and the interrelationship with the populist leader. Here it's important to remember that political leadership may of course influence said public opinion to support a retentionist agenda. It is therefore not irrelevant to the question of abolition in terms of whether or not public opinion plays a role and further research is needed in terms of factors that may influence public opinion, including the role of the media in influencing public opinion and other elites and deterrence. That brings me to the end of my discussion today with seconds to spare um, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Natalia, for a brilliant presentation. Um, I well, thank you. First, I want to say thank you to everyone, especially those involved in the organization, Liz, Maximo, Ryan, thank you very much. And also, I want to say after I, at the beginning, especially thanks, because to talk about lynching at a workshop about punishment and peripheries, put on the table, other ways to punish beyond the criminal justice systems that are currently being developed in many of our countries. Um, greetings from Mexico. Here it's very early, so the still <laughs> the sun doesn't rise. Uh, so I'm sorry for all this darkness. Now, um, Moving to matter, I have structured my presentation as follows. Um, first, I present the aims of, of my presentation, and later I will say a few words about the context in central Mexico, Mexico in general, but especially in central Mexico, in, in Puebla, as one state where, I, where this research takes place. Then I mention some definitions very fast because I will focus on lynching in Puebla and these lynchings as a necropolitic strategy. I must say here that the objective of my original research was to know the human rights factors that perceive and lead to lynching. Um, and what I will present here are like the first reflections derived from the findings that led me to think the lynching as a necropolitic strategy. Um, so the, the, the objective, I, I, I said that I will present here one of reflections. I mean, this is the, like the, the, the first the first place where I where I can show these ideas that as, as a result of my own research. So the objective of this presentation is to characterize and the rise of mob lynching in Puebla as a result of democratization of violence. I will come back to this definition later but also as a functional necropolitic strategy to maintain the social order and control. First, I need to, to say something about the context of Puebla. Puebla it is in central Mexico, as you can see in the map, is one of the three, three states who conform the Republic of Mexico is the fifth state in population with 6.5 million and almost half of the population lives in city of Puebla, the capital. Um, 
the state of Puebla also has 64% of its population in poverty and 9% of its population are indigenous. This makes Puebla the top four of the poorest states in Mexico and um, with more indigenous people living here. This talk about this bigger inequalities between the city and the rest of the territory, just in general. Also part of this context of the move lynching rise in the state is in 2006, former President Calderon declared the war on drugs to the organized crime and the drug cartels through the frontal combat and militarization of the public security. This gave us a result, the devastated result, hundreds and hundreds of dead people and killings and hundreds of hundreds of missing people and counting. This politic of militarization is still going on. So this is the context, like this very violent context where this research with this research is about. Now I will say some points about what is lynching. This is a broad definition of lynching. It's the violent action of citizens against other citizens who have presumably committed a crime or violated a social norm. This is a broad definition, but one key notion of this definition of lynching is the idea of vigilantism. I mean, when regular people, the citizens who defend the current social order and the status quo. And on the other hand, a brief idea of what is necropolitics. This concept refers to power, to power, politic and death, specifically the way the life is managed. The political production of death, a policy where life is the object of calculation. Is a conjunct of practices that produce deaths through a systematic exercise of violence and terror. It means the death as a specific technology of colonial origin for the management of the exclude. This is how life is managed, but the life of some people specifically, the exclude. So we can think broadly in war on drugs or the people we have in prison and of course people victims of, lyn of lynching from this point of view. Now, the origin of lynching, according to previous literature, I make these three categories, especially the Latin American literature, observe the rise of lynching after big and fast social changes. I, I mean, this discomposition of social structures, especially after wars, for example, in the case of Guatemala. Um, in recent times, studying in Latin American cities see lynching as response to increase of violence and crime. And link it to these two, other authors mention this perception of absence state. This means the state can't answer to all the reality in, in, in some specific territories. And the state is not able to provide what they need, what, what, what the citizens need, especially in this case on security and justice. Now, talking specifically about lynching in Puebla, I mean this in, in central Mexico, what we found is the increase and expansion of lynching in the last in the last years. Almost we passed from three consummated lynching in 2015 to 18 consummated lynching in 2019, just to put some numbers. We also found that the, the violated social norm, what I mentioned in the definition, is always an alleged crime. This is special because in other contexts, people lynch because other things, maybe for 
religion motivations or, or witchcraft or something like that, that doesn't happen in, in Puebla. It's always an alleged crime who, who start this lynching as answer. Also, we observe that the lynching has, in, in, specifically in Puebla, has a re ritualization who share symbolic and communicational meaning. I come back with this a bit later. And one of, of, the, of our conclusions is that lynching is one strategy of so many others to deal with delinquency and the fear of crime. It's also a way to punish. I, 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 I like to think, I mean, this idea related to social capital. If, if, if you have enough capital, you can manage your fear of crime in different ways. Maybe, maybe well, in the case of Mexico, you can move to other city or you can you can pull, you can put CTV, CCTV in your house, etc. But some people doesn't have these resources and they have to manage in a different way this fear of crime. So based in our research, the audience specifically in Puebla between 2015 and 2019, and based in a demographic review and a database construction and principal component analysis comparing a series of variables related to violence, the state responses, and other variables, we found that the structural violence, the delinquency rates, and this sense of absence of state of the state are the most important things related to 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 lynching the structural violence i mean this abandonment of the welfare state derived from neoliberal policies this historical violence the delinquency rates derived from this war on drugs that i that i mentioned um this failure of the monopoly of violence who has supposedly to have the state this monopoly of violence now this violence moves or are challenging by the criminal groups and now the citizens can be violence can be violence too this is what i call democratize democratizing of violence and this absent state i mean the state selectively decide to be weak in some cases, especially in lynching cases. Um, this is, I, I mean, of course, in Mexico we have a, 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 a state with their institutions, and we have the police and the military doing security, citizenship works, and. But they select, they choose where to show power and they choose where not to do anything about. So this idea leads me to think about, or not to think about, to ask me about the democratization of violence is a necropolitic strategy. I mean, who wins with the, the lynching? I mean, because someone is winning, I, I think someone is, is, is winning. I mean, this rise in the number and the geographical expansion, it's not for, for free, it's something like that. So I compare some characteristics, some characteristics of necropolitics with what we found in in our research about lynching. The necropolitics has this characteristic. Mm, they, they, there is a security policy. And I said, or, or think about lynching as a necropolitic strategy. And I said, of course, lynchings are illegal. But the development of policies such as Vecino Vigilante, Vigilante Neighborhood, leave security in the hands of individuals, of regular citizens. This is 
the weakness of, of the state, selective weakness, weakness to maintain the social order. Another characteristic of necropolitics is the daily life of violence and fear. And we are living now in Mexico, a context where life worth less and less and less. So this lead some people to this kind of democratization of violence. Not only the state or the organized crime can be violent, also can the citizen, the citizens can be violent too. Another characteristic is the reinforcement of the figure of the enemy, I mean the other as an enemy. And this is very interesting because the excluded, lynching the excluded. Now, and this remains the direction of violence in one clear direction, you know, like in a horizontal and very low direction. This depoliticizing the social movements. To have a clear enemy, I mean, the, the one who commits a crime with very specific characteristics, led to, to depoliticize the social movement and the government stayed very, very quiet and okay if the rest of the population or the rest of citizens have one enemy in common with this. This lead to, to reinforce, for example, these punitive populism discourses. No? So, and the other characteristic is the aspect of, of violence, this performativity of the violent bodies as a pedagogy of cruelty, as Segaro, Segaro says. This has a better effect, of course, and, but also has a symbolic message, this message of maintain the social order and to maintain punitive populist discourses and where the citizens have to, to manage and to take um, the, the, the role that must be of the government or the state. And finally, this exhibition of repression instruments. In case of lynching, there's no um, exhibition of this repression in instrument, but I don't like to say like soft power because it's nothing soft in lynching, but I mean, lynchings could be everything but soft, but it's a way that, that, that could be mask the state of violence. I mean, in this case, the instrument of repression are present for absent. I mean, this idea of letting, letting this occur. I want to finally, I mean, I don't know if I, if you follow, follow these ideas, what I want to finish with, with, with this idea. First, they kill us. I mean, like we can think in the dictation, dictatorial states, like in the seven, 16, 17s, first they kill us. Maybe now the police is still they kill us, but these ways of control change and then they, they let, us, let us die with these neoliberal policies. And now with this permissiveness of lynching, of social violence, now they let kill us each other. So this is the, the, the main ideas I think I'm getting out of time. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. And I will be glad to hear your comments. Thank you so much, Tadeo, for um, a very stirring presentation. Um, I will hand over now to Professor Carolyn Hoyle, who will be the discussant for today's session. Thank you, Lucy. Um, is that, am I coming through here? I've got some problems with my computer. No, I'm okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, 
Okay, well, well, thank you, Natalia, Rachel, and Tadeo for really interesting presentations. Um, in some ways quite different, but I think there are thematic parallels, so I just want to pick up on, on a few of those. Um, so I think these papers make clear that there are penal practices that clearly operate outside of criminal justice systems. Um, and obviously the most apparent um, version of this is today's presentation on lynching in Mexico. Uh, informal but extreme punishments imposed by the people on those considered to be uh, of, of a threat to the security of society. And the fact that his presentation demonstrated these alarming rises in the rates since 2015, I think is worth uh, us thinking a little bit more about it in, in the questions. Um, and of course, uh, the penal practices operating outside the criminal justice system is also clear in, in Rachel's paper. Um, when we think about the, the preventive detention without trial of those suspected of crimes against the state, something that those of us in the UK saw a good deal of uh, during the conflict in, in Northern Ireland. Um, and then in Southeast Asia, especially of course in the Philippines and Indonesia, as Natalia alluded to, this is uncommon um, uh, to, to have that sort of extrajudicial process in terms of pre-trial protections, but it's not uncommon in terms of the uh, extrajudicial killings of suspected drug traffickers by the police. So many thousands of people are shot each year by the police when suspected of trafficking in drugs with entirely implausible reports suggesting that they were killed while trying to resist arrest. So there were clear parallels between uh, some of what the, Natalia was talking about and some of what Tadeo was talking about. Um, and of course, in these cases, the state is operating outside of the official criminal or judicial process, either legally or, or illegally, and, and justifying this in terms of a war. And so a war against terrorism, a war against drugs. Either way, it's, it's the state claiming to be under siege. Or, or in today's example, the, the people claiming to be under siege and doing its best to protect and defend its own citizens. So that siege mentality, I think, is, is present in all of these uh, presentations, or at least in the, in the backdrop. And of course, to make this claim, those citizens um, uh, must be labelled accordingly. They must be labelled as the most serious criminals. So in Israel's case, this means the criminalisation of political activism, as indeed uh, it did in Northern Ireland and, and in South Africa. Um, uh, and this, uh, this uh, obscuring the political motivation of certain crimes uh, and, and, and labelling people accordingly, something that was strongly resisted in, in those other jurisdictions I mentioned, though at the time to, to limited effect. And in Asia, of course, it means insisting that drug offences are among the most serious crimes, uh, notwithstanding the ICCPR, and, and therefore deserving of the ultimate penalty. And of course, there in Mexico, it means those who are thought to violate social norms not to commit crimes, especially those crimes seem to damage the social fabric of society, i.e. drug crimes. Um, so the papers also share a focus on proportionality. Uh, so in Asia, under the banner of the war on drugs, the death penalty is used for drug crimes, uh, not OK under international law. Uh, crimes that don't involve intentional killing. Um, and in Israel, preventative detention uh, without trial and life sentencing, following, following hearings in military courts, sometimes handed down in absentia, again, uh, breaching all kind of international due process laws. Um, they are inevitably disproportionate, not to mention unsafe. And of course, again, the most disproportionate is, is extrajudicial killings of suspected criminals in Mexico, not even people who've been in any way subject to uh, any sort of criminal process. So there's this othering of some citizens, othering of people that can result in blatant breaches of rights to respect, to dignity, to fair process. Um, uh, and and in, in Southeast Asia, at least, the, the public and the government alike scapegoat those who commit crimes with this populist punitive agenda that Natalia talked about, bent on seeing them as causing the great harms to the social, economic and moral fabric of society, rather than seeing uh, drug misuse as, as, as a social or a medical problem need, needing of therapeutic interventions. And again, in Mexico, people seen as challenging public order, safety, security, they're subject to punishment by the people. Lynching is basically an extreme version of what we saw the IRA punishment uh, doing in punishment meetings in Northern Ireland in the Troubles. Um, 
But uh, across the papers, what you're seeing is punishment during times of conflict. And the notion of conflict plays out differently in these three jurisdictions, but it's still there. Um, it's most obviously there in, in, in Israel, um, where the narrative is about terrorist attacks from neighbors or from others within the state, as you will see across Asia. And the ongoing conflict between Israeli government and Palestinians who, who engage in activities that come to the attention of the state as, as threats to security um, is, is the political backdrop there. And it, it's obviously recently been very evident as news media around the world have, have reported on rockets flying from Gaza into Tel Aviv and, and even further afield and then reprisal attacks by um, Israeli police and security forces and even by the ordinary citizens on Palestinians. So it's clearly a state that's either in conflict, it's recovering from conflict, it's preparing itself for another conflict, or it's trying through legal, political or other measures to prevent further conflict. Um, a, a state in crisis in this, in this regard. And, and across Southeast Asia and Mexico uh, in particular, again, the narrative is around the threat to the nation's health caused by the influx of drugs. And, and, and so this is a society that's seen as in conflict with itself, with its own people and the dangers that they pose to the security. Um, and if you think about the war on drugs in those terms, and, and that's how it plays out in the Philippines and other parts of, of Southeast Asia, uh, that's, that's the notion of the people uh, uh, in conflict with the state. And you then get responses as, as today's presentation noted in Mexico, where you get a further militarization of the public and militarization of, of the state's response. And that's been seen in many countries, including Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Sri Lanka, um, and, and most obviously in the Philippines. Um, so, so pulling all that together, the sort of disproportionate penalties, the uh, pre-trial punishment or pre-trial processes that breach all, all of our notions of what, what is right and proper. Um, what kind of questions does this raise? Well, um, it, 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 all papers made me think about what role there is for international law. Um, but also in asking that question, what is the place of academics from liberal democracies asking these questions? Um, what role is there for an expression of human rights that talks not of security and rights of the masses to be free from terrorism or from the significant harms that can be caused by drug crimes in these countries? So does human rights have a, a currency in such places where the threats to the, to the social fabric of life, the economy and the, and the people are not insignificant? And I think that's really important because all three papers make that clear. So what are the risks, I guess, to promoting a language of rights, a language of the individual against the might of the state for those of us who live and work in liberal democracies and that are not actually exposed to such risks on a daily basis? does that language work or is it incumbent on us to find another way to communicate? Is it, is it perhaps um, harnessing less Western notions, perhaps dignity, for example, rather than rights? Um, and, and certainly Natalia and Rachel uh, talk about the legal context and within which human rights abuses and disproportionate punishments take place, about the international norms and treaties that aim to prevent such but but there are challenges to what the world can do when such treaties are basically honored in the breach in many different countries um of course with the death penalty if we think about natalia's paper it might be somewhat easier because europe for example can act as a collective it has the power and the influence that brings with it um uh, the language of rights because it's not morally ambivalent because all european nations with the exception of belarus have, have abolished but it's harder in the other jurisdictions, I think, or it's harder for other countries. Um, so today I talked about the absence of a welfare orientated state, especially in a, a neoliberal political context. And, and when you get that absence, what you see is people filling a void, a void where there's a the, the void of legally appropriate ways of responding to violence. And um, with Israel, with the, the treatment of Palestinians accused of security offences, European nations might be on shakier ground because those of us with close ties to the US or the UK have, to a greater or lesser extent, been complicit in atrocities with, with rendered people in the war of terror. 
um, Guantanamo Bay is an obvious example, but also uh, moral ambivalence around policing of the troubles in, in Northern Ireland. So how easy, how easy is it, I guess, for, for countries that can't always assume the high moral ground to make a stand on such issues? Um, and then there's the matter of sovereignty, uh, certainly across Asia. Uh, state sovereignty and a commitment to non-interference from other states makes it really quite difficult to challenge penal policy in those states. They assert that they have the sovereign right to self-govern on all matters, not least criminal and penal policy. And some countries like Singapore are more trenchant on this issue, but all of them to, to, to some extent assert that position. Um, and the fact is they that these are states that are vulnerable to extreme forms of violence, to terrorism, to social disorder, to the influx of drugs. And so, I mean, if you take the recent UNODC reports on uh, showing record levels of drug production and trafficking in, in the Golden Triangle with incredibly high amounts of synthetic opioids crossing borders in Southeast Asian region and the price of street, the street price of drugs being very low. We know that these are very real harms affecting uh, citizens in Southeast Asia. They just can't be ignored. And so those of us with our good liberal credentials in the West saying that, um, you know, we should just uh, be cuddly in all our criminal justice responses have to be mindful of the fears of the people on the ground. Um, and again, in Mexico, people are afraid of um, the both the indirect harms generated by unregulated drug production and distribution, but also the regulation where they are controlled by violent organized crime groups. Uh, these, these visit incredible harms on the citizens and, and we, we can't, when we talk about human rights, be uh, ignorant of that. And of course, in, in Rachel's presentation, citizens of Israel are worried about rockets coming from Gaza, um, especially now that those weapons are becoming more sophisticated and can reach much further into that country. So I suppose what I'm saying is that, that how do the presenters feel about what kind of appropriate responses to these significant breaches of due process, significantly harsh penal policies in these three different jurisdictions, where we need to acknowledge the concerns about crimes and, and dangerous behaviours. And the question would be, I guess I'm rambling now, but the question I think has to be, what would be the promise, but also what would be the pitfalls of challenging these practices by harnessing human rights? And I suppose that's what I would like the presenters to, to perhaps address. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Carolyn, um, for such a thorough and thought-provoking um, response to the presentations and also for very deftly bringing together the three presentations and showing how they connect to one another. Um, we will now start the Q&A session um, during which the speakers can respond to the discussant if they wish. Um, but we will start by opening the, opening the floor to participants' questions. So feel free to raise your hand um, if you would like to ask a question. 